Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Braden Knudsen. and I'll be your host for this webinar. And we have a few polls down at the bottom of the screen that we'd like to ask you to fill out for us as we go through our announcements and introductions today. Um, so our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 16th at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, and that webinar will be um, Digging Deeper into Google for Genealogists by James Tanner. And if you remember, that is the webinar that was interrupted last month, and so we'll be uh, redoing it on May 16th so that we can get through it and um, pass along that information again. So that'll be a good one. Um, and if you have any suggestions for us, you can go ahead. There's a poll. You can write in um, for any topics you'd like to hear about, or you can email us anytime, and we'd love to get suggestions and incorporate those into um, into the webinars in the future. So today we'll be pleased to hear from Bob Taylor. We'll be giving a presentation titled Getting People into Family History. Bob Taylor, CEO of the Family History Guide L3C, has been actively doing family history for over 25 years. He has combined his passion for genealogy with his background in instructional design to produce a new learning resource for family history, the Family History Guide. Bob earned his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University and master's degree from California State University, Los Angeles, both in music education. He has been a featured presenter at Roots Tech 2016, UV TAG, and the BYU Family History Conference, in addition to numerous family history fairs in Utah. A career change led him to instructional design and technical writing where he has worked for large technology corporations such as Novell, Intel, and Western Digital. At Intel University, he redesigned key training courses for employees and managers worldwide, as well as teaching management courses in Washington, Arizona, Oregon, California, and Utah. He has authored many online and written learning systems, helping others accelerate learning in technology, music, and family history. Bob and his wife Susie have five daughters and six grandchildren. So as we turn the time over to Bob, we'll remind you that we have a comments box and a chat box on the right-hand side. Um, Feel free to write in with any questions um, as we go through the presentation. We'll get those answered by the, um, by the end of the presentation. Um, and so we'll just let Bob go ahead and share his screen now, and he can take it away for us. Welcome, everyone, to the webinar on getting people into family history. This is a subject very near and dear to my heart. Um, as I have the opportunity to travel with the Family History Guide at different conventions and family history fairs and so forth. I never get tired of those what I call light bulb moments where we show people how they can get into family history and how it can be made easier and more enjoyable. And you watch the light bulbs go on and to me that's worth, uh, worth the price of admission right there. Um, we don't make a terrific lot of money with the Family History Guide because it's a free website, but we do get an immense amount of satisfaction out of seeing people um, have those light bulb moments and discovering that family history is something that they enjoy and that they really can do. So with that said, only a very small percentage of people are actively involved in family history. I've heard different numbers quoted, such as maybe 3%, 5%, 10%. But no matter what the percentages are, we I think we can all agree that the percentages are too low. There should be a lot more involvement in family history. So why is that, and what can we do about it? The mission of the Family History Guide is to greatly increase the number of people actively involved in family history worldwide and to make everyone's experience easier, more efficient, and more enjoyable. So here's what we will cover in the webinar this evening. The appeal of family history, the pool, connections and strategies, conclusion, and after the conclusion, we're going to take a brief stroll through the Family History Guide website uh, pointing at the training section to give you a few ideas on how consultants and trainers can get people involved in family history using the Family History Guide. The appeal. Yes, now be honest, some of you have had that type of reaction, I'm sure, when you discover new ancestors or when you make a breakthrough. 
um, or just have one of those aha moments in your family history. And these kids, of course, are very upfront about the way that they feel, but uh, some of us have experienced that. So what makes family history so appealing to some people? The chance to connect to your ancestors as real people is an awesome experience. Plus, you get to discover more about yourself when you realize that you're linked to your ancestors and you inherit their uh, characteristics, traits, and so forth. Gaining historical and cultural perspectives. Family history is a wonderful um, training ground for learning about history, culture, and so forth. And, of course, the thrill of the hunt for ancestors never seems to get old. On the other hand, what makes family history not so appealing to other people? For some, it may seem to be a bit too difficult or specialized, and they view it as work but not fun. And many people are simply not aware of the joy and empowerment of feeling connected to their ancestors and to their heritage. And until you've had that experience, it's a little hard to put into words. Um, those of us that have had it um, are pretty much converted to it, and uh, that's why we stick with uh, genealogy and family history. There are a few myths and mistakes that we should mention here as well. Common family history myths keep some people from getting started, and we talk about some of those in the family history basics section in the family history guide. Once people have started with their family history, there are some common mistakes that they can make that might discourage them from continuing with their family history. So in the family history guide, you can see goal six, choice A in project four, discover for details about how to avoid common mistakes. So let's dive in, take a look at the challenges that people typically have in first of all getting into the game and then staying in the game um, of family history. The pool. Um, some of you may remember that the Family History Guide posted an article on its website. It will also be coming out uh, in a newsletter format as well. But let's talk about this interesting experience. I'm comparing family history involvement to a swimming pool. And I think hopefully you'll see the metaphor and you'll see the connection there. So there are four stages of family history that can be compared to a swimming pool. Stage zero, you're sitting on the deck. Stage one, you've got your feet in the water. Stage two, you're actually wading in the pool. And stage three is swimming. And here is a link to where you might find that on the Family History Guide, the complete article. Stage zero, on the deck. So some of us have what I would call genealogy water fears. We're fear afraid of the water, and some of these fears might include more specifically, it's too difficult. I don't know where to start. I don't have the time and I'll leave it to the experts. So I'm betting that probably most of you have heard these fears, excuses, whatever you like to call them, um, from friends who have told you that they're not really into family history or have never made the jump in and so forth and are hesitant to do so. So it's good to remember that these are some common fears and perhaps we've had these fears or anxieties at some time as well. Let's take a look at these uh, one by one. It's too difficult. Well, not really. Family history has elements that even children can understand and enjoy. And I'm sure that most of you have seen children actually get involved in family history in one aspect or another. I've seen eight and 10 year olds at a family history library basically catch the vision of what family history is it about, is about even to the point of being able to do some basic research. I remember talking to one 10-year-old boy and he said 
you know, I've got ancestors, great grandparents from Florida. And I said, well, you could do family history and genealogy research for them. And he said, no, nah, I don't think so, because I really can't afford to go to Florida. And I said, you know, you don't have to go to Florida. For example, with Family Search, you can see records about your ancestors right here online. You don't have to hop on a plane. And he just looked at me and said, really? So that was his aha moment as a 10 year old. And he was into the game uh, for family history. Most of us have done more complicated things in our lives than family history as a whole. And uh, it varies by person, but family history has a reputation of being deep, abstract, uh, kind of strange and so forth. But uh, anyone that's been to school uh, has probably uh, done some things that are perhaps even more difficult uh, than family history. These days, it's a lot easier to find great tools, websites, and helpful people. I remember back in the day when basically you had to write a letter, put the stamp on, send it in the mail, wait a couple of weeks until someone got back to you with a reply like, sorry, don't have any information, Try again. Um, things have progressed enormously, and it's a lot more enjoyable and more efficient these days. And yes, it can be fun. A lot of the fun depends on success. So as we're getting people involved in family history, we want to make sure that they are having some mini successes that can keep them motivated and really help them feel like they're enjoying it and having fun. Here's a thought that we should think about. We mistakenly think that getting started with family history work means we are supposed to jump into the deep end of, re of the research pool and either sink or swim. You'd be surprised at how many people think that's basically what you're supposed to do. I remember uh, reading a blog post about a person whose first experience was going to uh, a large historical library and the librarian there introduced her into a big kind of a vault room with a bunch of books and says, here you go, have fun. And this person was an absolute beginner and sat there staring at the piles of books for nearly an hour before just getting up and walking out. So that's kind of reminded me of that phrase and that experience. Number two, I don't know where to start. Well, you start at the beginning, but that can be a little bit tricky. Where is the beginning? Each person is likely to have a preferred starting point. And our task as helpers is to discover where that start, the optimal starting point for them is. It may not even be what they say. They may say they want to start at a certain place, but they may need to start somewhere else. Building a family tree, dealing with memories, DNA tests, and so forth are all possible starting points. And we're going to talk about starting points in the connections and strategies section of this webinar uh, for some more ideas a little bit later on. Information overload keeps people from seeing how simple the family history experience can be. And I've experienced that firsthand in developing the Family History Guide. Family History Guide is all about gating and regulating the flow of information so that people don't get overwhelmed with the amount that there is. One of the uh, mistakes that we as coaches, trainers, um, motivators, and so forth for family history um, typically make or can make is that we are so excited to get somebody going that we tend to offer too much information and that can be a deterrent rather than a help. Number three, I don't have the time. Well, hmm, how much time do you need to spend on family history? I think it's time to, that we redefine family history success. What does it mean? Does it mean spending hours and hours and, and a huge amount of time on family history. I remember being in a leadership meeting where Elder Ronald Rasban said, um, all of you in the audience, and he was speaking to men, um, if you would give up one episode of ESPN Sports Center per week and instead dedicate that to family history 
your lives will be greatly blessed. And I thought to myself, that is a great idea. I think everybody should do that. But he didn't stop there. He proceeded to pull out of his uh, suit coat some photos of his aunt and some memorabilia and so forth. And he said, this is what I've been working on this past week. And he proceeded to tell us some stories about his aunt and ancestors and so forth. And the thing that struck me there was that here is a man who is immensely busy. And yet he knew what he was talking about. He was living the example. He was doing his family history. He wasn't spending three days a week on it full time, but he was spending enough time that he was able to make some breakthroughs and some successes happen. So that had a great impression on me. Once a person sees an objective and the direction it takes to get there, the time factor usually takes care of itself. And you'll notice that whenever you're doing something that's particularly enjoyable, time seems to go by pretty fast. And of course, that can be uh, uh, a problem in itself if we let the time get away from us. Family history should not be a black hole of time and energy. It should be a vital part of a balanced, enjoyable life. Think about that. Um, some people are hesitant to get into family history thinking that they will be sucked into a black hole because they see others who basically have had that or are having that happen to them. So one of the keys for us in helping people see the beauties and benefits of family history is when they see that, yes, you can have a balanced and enjoyable life and still be involved in family history. Surprise, it really does work. Number four, I'll leave it to the experts. I bet a lot of you have heard that. Um, my Aunt Sally does it all. My Uncle John takes care of our family tree and so forth. Problems with that rationale are you can still enjoy family history and thrive on it without being an expert. And perhaps the biggest one, we need family history connections with our ancestors and living relatives just as much as the experts do. It's kind of twisted logic to say that certain people who are into genealogy are the ones that should have those meaningful connection experiences. The rest of us don't need them. That's really not true. And there's always plenty for everyone to do. The experts, so to speak, will never get all of the work done. Success in family history is more often achieved by connections than by breakthroughs. And if you think about this statement, breakthroughs may not happen all that often. When they do happen, they're pretty exciting. But you can have connections to an ancestor as you read through their life stories or discover records about them. Even connections to information sometimes will get you really excited and fulfilled. So there's lots of connections possible on a more ongoing basis and the breakthroughs are especially exciting when they do happen. All right, stage one, we're getting our feet in the water. Uh, for a successful intro to family history, a beginner might want to go with a friend, such as us that are into family history. Start easy, enjoy and learn. Get in and out smoothly. So let's see how this is done. First of all, go with a friend. We can offer to guide someone through their first family history, history steps. Or we can point them to the family history guide for their own guided learning experience. Um, I've had this happen where someone will say, um, I'd like to get started with family history and I don't have the time to sit down with them, but I'll say, well, there's this website called the family history guide and here's the web site URL and it's basically a, a structured learning environment and they'll be off and running and they'll do just fine with it. Optimal, if you can, is both. Guide them and use the family history guide as a guided learning experience. Start easy, enjoy and learn. The emphasis here is on small tasks. If you convey to your friend that uh, you are going to do something 
that maybe to you sounds doable or is even long term, they don't necessarily want to know how huge the ocean is that they're going to be <laughs> swimming across. They want to know how they can get from point A to point B successfully. So part of the objective here is to create small tasks that they can do and you can help them with. Creating a login into Family Search, navigating their existing tree, browsing through memories, and so forth. Each task that they find success with can build a connection point. So as we said, <clears throat> they can really benefit by enjoying small victories and getting acquainted with their ancestors in the process. It helps to reflect on what you're learning and how that will help you going forward. The thing we want to avoid is having a learning experience and then saying, okay, that's a checklist item. I got past that. Now what's next? Everything that we learn should be carried forward with this because it's going to shape our future experience in family history. Some things more important than others. Get in and out easily. This is something we don't think about all that much. Know where you've been and what you want to do next. Some people take their feet right out of the water because they don't keep track of where they've been and where they're going. And retracing steps and going around in circles can be fairly discouraging. Like we said before, you want to keep focused on narrow goals. Don't get swept away in trying to do it all. And now we go to stage two, waiting. Family history waiting is all about having the basics down of family history, finding and, and using effective sites and tools, and getting into a rhythm of time and effort for satisfying results. This is somewhat like the intermediate stage, you might say, of family history. Having the basics down means, for example, being able to navigate through family tree, understanding and managing person pages. This is something that sometimes we forget about how important this is. Maybe we think that, okay, we've got the navigation thing down, fine, but until you can manage a person page, be able to add information, change information, um, view the family relationships correctly and find what you need, um, you, there's still work to do. Handling family search memories, such as browsing them, uploading them, so forth. And gaining skill in sourcing and standard practices. Those are the basics that you should feel comfortable with as you envision yourself waiting in the family history pool. Effective sites and tools. Be comfortable with using family search features. Being able to do searches on partner sites, such as Ancestry, MyHeritage, and Find My Past. And using the Family History Guide as an ongoing learning resource, and we'll talk more about that later. Getting into a rhythm is really important. It's important to decide on a flexible schedule for time that you want to spend each week. Flexible, yes. Schedule, yes. Set small, realistic goals to keep you moving. And generally speaking, avoid family history binges and droughts. And this is hard to do sometimes because when you're on a roll, the natural inclination is just to keep it rolling and to keep it going. And sometimes other things will come up and you'll get out of the family history routine. And Either way, it's hard to, to stop that momentum one way or the other. When you're on a roll, sometimes you just need to stop the train and say, okay, I know where I am. I'm coming back in a while and I'll pick it up um, because you may get burned out after several binges. And with droughts, sometimes you can just forget about the wonderful experiences and feelings that you've had in family history if the drought or the time between family history experiences goes on too long. Stage three, swimming. Genealogy swimmers. They're seasoned researchers. They're well connected. And they're in it for the long haul. 
Seasoned researchers understand and use proven research techniques. Project four of the Family History Guide has a lot of these encapsulated and explained so that you can use them in your own research. They're skilled at sourcing and documenting their finds, and they're adept at finding new ways to solve old problems. That's one of the things that you gain through practice in doing family history research. Well connected. They follow leading family history bloggers, social media channels. They know the pros and cons of family history sites and software programs. And they know where to turn for help themselves, and they're usually willing to help others. So they realize that it's not about just holding yourself up in a room and doing your own dedicated research. There are many times when you need to be, as a genealogy swimmer, reaching out to others and getting their input, getting their feedback. And to pay it forward, you pass along that expertise to others who are needing it as well. In it for the long haul, the swimmers are committed to family history as a lifelong pursuit and passion, and they are patient, persistent, and realistic. Failure in one of those three areas could pretty much uh, submarine the whole thing. You've got to be patient, you've got to be persistent, and you've got to be realistic. All right, so let's talk about the swimming pool and the distribution. If you're picturing a swimming pool and all of the people in it or out of it. Where we are currently seems to be on the deck there are countless masses of people that just stretch on and on. Feet in the water, um, too many people are getting their feet in the water and then pulling them back out because they don't feel that they've had a successful experience. Wading in the pool, relatively small numbers, and swimming also small numbers. So where do we want to be with this ratio and this distribution? We want to shrink the masses of people on the deck. Obviously, we want to get more people into family history. Once their feet are in the water, we want a high conversion rate of feet in the water people to waders. And that's typically where things break down. People will get in, they may not have a great experience or whatever the reason, and they don't get it to that intermediate stage where a lot of the enjoyment happens. Waiting is the sweet spot. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we want to have increasing numbers of swimmers. So you may be wondering, well, wouldn't the goal be to just push everybody through this pool process and get the greatest number of swimmers that we can? I don't think that that's totally realistic. I don't think most people want to become serious genealogists and really experienced um, family researchers and family history. I could be wrong there, but that's uh, my experience and what I've seen. What I believe the sweet spot to be is the waiting phase. So basically, these are people like if you remember, as we talked about uh, the waiters, the characteristics. These are people who have the basics down. They understand what they're doing. They know how to get in and out, and they're on a fairly regular schedule so that they can enjoy what they're doing without having to be deeply immersed or spend huge amounts of time or, or expertise and so forth. So that's kind of where I think the greatest um, concentration should be is building the number of waiters that we have in the family history pool. So let's talk about some connections and strategies. Connection points. Now, as we talk about connections, we mentioned earlier that you can connect, have a feeling of connection with your ancestors. Um, the points in your family history experience that kind of connect like a spark plug or, or a wire that make that connection possible are the things in this list that I would recommend. Number one, building a family tree. Number two, collecting and sharing your ancestors' memories. Finding new cousins. That may sound a little bold. Uh, my individual story is fairly astonishing. 
in doing my family history, I have actually discovered a number of first cousins that I did not know existed. We had somewhat of a fracture in our family. Some people didn't want to talk to other people and so forth. But by doing family history, I have come to know cousins, first cousins that I did not know existed. And that is an amazing feeling. Of course, finding new cousins can also be third, fourth, fifth, and so forth. Learning how to research new information. Indexing records to help others. Collaborating and getting help. Learning new technologies to help you along. And discovering your heritage through DNA tests. So as you look at this list, all of these can be connection points that resonate with some people, maybe more than others, but there's got to be something on that list that would reach just about anybody, anywhere, and you can probably visualize or empathize with that. Connection points are a lot better than checklists. You don't want to measure your uh, family history experience by, quote, the number of things you, that you got done, unquote. So how do we build personal connections in our family history work? Well, we add the family history guide. And you'll see, those of you that are familiar with the family history guide, when you saw that list of eight connection points, you would have noticed a real resemblance to that and the eight projects in the family history guide. So building a family tree is covered in project one, where you navigate family tree, update person pages, add ancestors and sources, clean up the tree and merge records and produce family history charts. Um, number two is related to project number two in the family history guide. Gathering records, interviewing relatives, browsing photos and documents, sharing them, writing life sketches and history. Number three, project three, descendancy, finding new cousins, identifying descendancy lines using family search tools, bazilla.org and other tools. Learning how to research new information is project four. Get organized, identify lines, form strategies for success, learn internet search skills, learn problem solving skills. So as you look through these bullet points, any one of these items, any one particular item might be that connection point that gets someone into family history if they can be successful with it. And the whole purpose of the family history guide is to help them not be overwhelmed, but to be successful with particular skills, knowledge, and work that they're doing. Indexing records. And a side note here, uh, you're probably familiar that FamilySearch has redone their indexing. Um, they're now focusing on web indexing. So the Family History Guide is in the middle of being overhauled. Um, just one of those um, joys of being in the business. Uh, every time FamilySearch changes something significantly, we get to follow along and make the changes, corresponding changes in the Family History Guide. So learning how to index records, setting goals, using web indexing, that's the big thing now, and learning to decipher old handwriting. Collaborating, getting help, knowing where to find online help resources, this is project six. Joining Facebook groups and genealogy societies, this is a good one for those who are new to family history once they discover that they can get some organized and interesting help from a number of different directions collaborating with others, and helping others with their family history. Learning new technologies, accessing webinars and podcasts on family history, using mobile devices, laptops, social media tools. Some of the youth, when they discover, oh yeah, I can use social media, absolutely, for your family history and genealogy software programs. DNA heritage, take a DNA test, Learn how to match the results. Discover your ethnicity and family relationships. For LDS members, there is an LDS page in the Family History Guide. And of course, there's LDS.org that has plenty of ideas. And if you are not familiar with it, um, the Family History Guide is officially referenced on LDS.org as a source that is recommended um, by FamilySearch 
and approved by the LDS Church for doing training and learning in family history. In fact, we're going to have a new webinar in, uh, we just set the date for June, and now I'm <laughs> drawing a blank. It's the, I think it's June 8th. It's Thursday, the second Thursday in June, and it will be on the Family History Guide for LDS Users, exploring the tools that are available um, as an LDS um, individual researcher or Temple and Family History Consultant. So, in conclusion, takeaways that we want to remember. Into the pool. We need more people into the pool, especially waiters. Everybody jump in, grab your pool toys, and have fun waiting in the pool. We want to help others discover what their family history connection points are. We want to nurture and strengthen those connections, and one way to do that is by using the Family History Guide. And as consultants and trainers, if we are, we use the Family History Guide to involve and help others. So what can I do? What can we do individually? Share the Family History Guide via email or social media. And before you do that, you'll probably want to take a look at it and be familiar with it enough so that when people ask you questions about what does it do or how does it work or what does it cover, that you'll be fairly comfortable with that. Share your experiences or feelings about family history with family or friends. You'd be surprised at how many opportunities might come up where you could do that in a conversation and have some really nice results. Offer to help someone get started. And Project 6 in the Family History Guide um, is the help project. And then we have a training section of the Family History Guide that also has some ideas on getting people started in family history. So for consultants, trainers, and so forth, there's a training section in the Family History Guide. There's start, presentations, course catalog, audiences, which I call individuals, families, groups, and consultants, and tips and tracking. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to flip over to the Family History Guide website here. And I'll take you very briefly through the training portion. You see, this is the home page. And here we have the training area. And if I go to Start and click that, it gives basically an overview of what we do in training with the Family History Guide. And here's kind of a recap of our pool, four stages of family history. Also, some things we've added you might want to be aware of. Tutoring tips and techniques. This is really a really high quality article and links to 12 mistakes that mentors should avoid. You can easily adapt these to family history. How to set effective training goals. And here's an article, what freelance trainers ought to know about goal setting. Not necessarily family history specific, but very applicable in terms of the skill sets and the things that you want to accomplish. Presentations. Lots of free presentations that you can use to introduce other people, whether they're individuals or groups, um, organizations, to the Family History Guide. There's PowerPoint slides, there's documents, brochures free for download, videos and webinars. We add webinars as they occur to this list here. The course catalog. Some of you may not realize that there is an entire course catalog in the Family History Guide that basically helps you build free classes without doing a lot of the heavy lifting yourself. So if I wanted to offer a class in um, Family Tree Navigation, I just go to these, study these four goals in the Family History Guide, and there are exercises, instructor tips, and so forth, and you can select what types of videos and articles in the Family History Guide you want to show or talk about. And Pretty much presto, you have a built class that you did not have to develop a set of PowerPoint slides for or spend a lot uh, of time um, mulling over or figuring out what you're going to do. And the list goes on and on. There's mini classes, larger classes, and so forth. You can use these in group settings or even informally. Individuals, families, groups, consultants, 
Um, basically, here you've just got some framework of a setup, how you deliver the information, what do you do afterwards, and how do you measure your success. Training, consultants. There's a link to the LDS Consultant Planner here. Um, the same setup, delivery, after course, and so forth. Some suggestions on how to use the Family History Guide with Find, Take, Teach, and the Consultant Planner, and so forth, all integrated here. Online Tracker. This is a lot of fun. Um, I won't take the time to uh, explore this particularly uh, right now, but you can create an account, you can log in, you can go to a particular project, and you see I've been in here before, and I've taken a bunch of notes, and I've moved these slider bars as I move it. Oh, I just became proficient and so forth. How do you know if you're proficient or good? By completing the exercises that are in the goals and choices back in the Family History Guide. So this is a way to keep track of your own progress, and consultants can use it as a way to keep track of the people's progress that they're working with. And each change gets auto-updated and so forth. And you leave the screen. So let's go back. And tools. Miscellaneous training tips, instructor tips, uh, ways to make your classroom experience more, um, more effective. 100 questions and answers that, uh, that you might be asked and, and need to respond to with the answers, course evaluation forms, and so on and so forth. So that is pretty much it. Getting people into family history is a wonderful objective, and I wish each of you well. Uh, I wish each of you the inspiration to be able to take this information a piece at a time in whatever way you feel prompted to do so that you can help the Family History Guide and the Family History Guide can help you. And more than that, you can help your family and friends discover the joy and the possibilities of becoming involved in family history. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bob, for the wonderful presentation. I hope everyone's been able to enjoy it and um, learn how to spread the, the family history bug would be, um, would be kind of fun. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to enter those in into the questions pod in the lower right-hand corner, um, and we would be happy to answer those for you. Um, we'd like to remind you that this webinar has been recorded, so if there's something you, need to, you didn't quite understand or you want to come back, you can look for the video on our YouTube channel. Um, and that'll be up within the next few days or so. Um.